you know, it's complicated because like, even when I do an interview like this, I'm sort of playing into their narrative, right? Like it's about Steven Donziger. It's not about Steven Donziger. It is about Chevron and the poisoning of the Amazon rainforest. I'm your host, Adam Met, and today I'm talking to Stephen Donziger, a human rights and environmental lawyer. In 1993, Donziger sued Texaco for the pollution and health hazards that their oil drilling in Ecuador caused for the surrounding indigenous communities. About 20 years later, Chevron, which bought Texaco, lost the case, having to pay nearly $10 billion in damages. But they never did. Instead, they sued Donziger led a public campaign to discredit him, and forced him under house arrest for the last two years. We talk about the details of the case, the environmental effects of oil drilling, and the state of justice in America. A quick reminder that we're planting a tree for every person who subscribes to this podcast, so make sure to hit that subscribe button. And without further ado, here is Steven Donziger on Planet Reimagined. So before we jump into the saga... There is a possibility that you're going to jail on October 1st. This after being under house arrest for over two years for a misdemeanor. My first question is, how are you doing emotionally? Well, thank you. And thank you for having me. I, you know, I'm, I'm doing well emotionally, at least that's my perception of my emotional state. I mean, it's not easy, you know, I mean, this, I've been, wearing an ankle bracelet, living in my home, which is a two bedroom apartment in Manhattan. It's not a large home. Um, since August 6, 2019, it's now 773 days. I count the days every day. By the time I'm sentenced, it'll be 787 days. It's two weeks from today, I'm being sentenced. And on top of all this time on house arrest, uh, the judge, you know, has the right. I mean, I don't think it's legal personally, but she has the right to put me in prison for another six months or let me go free or do something in between. First of all, I have an ankle bracelet on my leg. Okay. And it's like the size of a garage door opener. It's pretty big. It probably weighs a pound. Um, And it it flashes a light tell you whether it's charged or not. And I get into bed with it at night. I shower with it. I eat with it. I sleep with it. It just never comes off. You know, it's been on this entire time. Uh, totally unnecessary, designed to humiliate, uh, you know, designed to remind you, you don't fully can be, you can't fully be you anymore. You don't, you've lost a certain level of your freedom. Um, you know, it's just unbelievable. But I'm, yeah. I, I also understand the big picture and, and, you know, I've been working on this case now 28 years and I don't get, I try not to at least get put off my game, my, our long-term plan by what they do to me. You know, we try to stick to our plan and, you know, this has been two years of, it's been an interesting two years because on the one hand, while my physical world has shrunk dramatically, my online world and my connectedness to, to the world, to people in Europe and Asia and Latin America and people like you even, others, you know, has expanded dramatically, exponentially. So, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people know about this now right. so, um, in a way that they wouldn't had they not locked me up. So, you know, I try to look at the bright side. Yeah. So I know that the entire story would take years to tell, but can you tell us the abbreviated story of how you ended up where you are today? Sure. So, you know, basically, you got to look at the story in three segments. Okay, segment one was the early 90s, when as a young lawyer, I went down to Ecuador with a team, we discovered this apocalyptic nightmare of a pollution disaster in the Amazon, where Texaco, now Chevron, had dumped billions of gallons of waste onto indigenous ancestral lands, and people were dying. And, you know, there were lakes of oil sludge in the rainforest, and we decided to do something about it. So we filed a lawsuit against Texaco in New York, where Texaco's headquarters were at the time. Texaco fought for years to move the case back down to Ecuador, where, you know, they had deliberately dumped this waste with impunity for 25 years. They thought they could just engineer a dismissal of the lawsuit. So that 
phase one took 10 years. They eventually got it down to Ecuador, accepted jurisdiction there, praised Ecuador's courts to get it there, promised to pay any adverse judgment as a condition of moving it there. So we had to then go down there and start creating a team of Ecuadorian lawyers to continue with the case, which we did. And that that's phase two. That took another eight years where Chevron tried, to, by this time Chevron had bought Texaco. So they were defending the case and Chevron used every trick it could think of to obstruct the case, sabotage the case, delay the case. They knew they were, the evidence was against them was overwhelming. Eventually we were able to win the case in 2011 at the trial level in Ecuador. Um, and it was ultimately affirmed by two appellate, three appellate courts in Ecuador. And as I said, the Canada Supreme Court in 2015. But in the meantime, they vowed never to pay the judgment. So phase three is what I would call the retaliation phase, which is what I'm still living in now, where they decided to demonize and criminalize our legal team with a particular focus on me, just because of the role I played. I was the leader, so to speak, raised most of the money. You know, I was the person speaking to the media, did a lot of the legal work. Um, I don't practice law in Ecuador, but I did it in other places. And, you know, they just went after me. I live in New York and they, they thought they could get a friendly judge in New York to go after me, which is exactly what happened. And I've been dealing with this for 10 years, you know, just to give you a little taste of it. In 2011, Chevron sued me personally in New York for $60 billion, not million, billion. It's the largest potential personal liability in US history against an individual. And, and like, I'm just a human rights guy working out of the kitchen of my apartment. I mean, that's how crazy it got. And, you know, I never sort of took it seriously, A, because I obviously could never pay that amount of money. I never had a lot of money. I'm a human rights lawyer. Um, but it was just obviously an attempt to intimidate me, an attempt to intimidate other lawyers and advocates into dropping the case. As a matter of fact, Chevron's lawyer, the, right after we won, threatened the indigenous groups in Ecuador with what he called a lifetime of litigation. Those are his words, unless they drop the case. You know, so who does this? I mean, who who litigates all these years, who wants the case in Ecuador, accepts jurisdiction there, and then you lose, suddenly you're threatening and suing everybody. But that's how, that's how Chevron operates. And by the way, it's also how a lot of fossil fuel companies operate. They do not want to pay a penny to people they harm because they're scared of the precedent it will set, that it will, it will create enormous liability, et cetera. My specific detention is a result of the fact that Chevron sued me for 60 billion. They paid a witness millions of dollars to come in and claim I bribed a judge in Ecuador. I did not bribe a judge in Ecuador. This allegation has been rejected by all these other appellate courts, 28 appellate judges, but there's one trial judge here in New York, Lou Kaplan, former tobacco industry lawyer who took it upon himself to work with the Chevron lawyers to basically try to destroy the case. And by do it, been doing it by going after me. And he credited this witness who presented this false testimony over me, there was no corroborating evidence at all, just words out of this guy's mouth. And he, he had been coached for 53 days by Chevron's lawyers before he testified. And on that basis, Kaplan found that I bribed a judge in Ecuador and he ruled that we couldn't collect money from Chevron in the United States, but he had no jurisdiction over other countries. So the communities are in Canada, Argentina, Brazil, going after Chevron's assets, but he did have jurisdiction over me personally, because I live here. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when the communities kept winning various court decisions around the world in an effort to collect Chevron's assets, Chevron went back to Kaplan, went after me, um, got him to impose literally millions and millions and millions of dollars of fines and court costs on me, which wiped me out financially. Yeah. And then they had a theory that I was hiding money and they wanted to get my computer and cell phone. And, and I refused to give it to them, appealed that order that would violate attorney client privilege and the confidentiality of my communications with my clients and would put their lives in jeopardy if Chevron got this information. I mean, it's just unheard of for a judge to order a lawyer to turn over his computer to an adversary counsel. It's just unbelievable. But when I appealed that, um, Kaplan charging with criminal contempt of court for not complying with his order that I had appealed. 
And not only that, his, his charges were rejected by the regular federal prosecutor in New York, known as the SDNY, very famous, you know, respected prosecutorial office here. Um, when they were rejected, the case should have gone away. Instead, Kaplan appointed a private law firm, Seward and Kissel, to prosecute me in the name of the public, a private law firm. And I later found out that this law firm, Seward and Kissel, had Chevron as a client. I mean, it's just the most extraordinary thing, which is why I say this is the first corporate prosecution in U.S. history. That is, Chevron is prosecuting me after the case was rejected by the Department of Justice. And then on top of that, Kaplan assigned the case to a friend of his, a judge, rather than going through the random assignment process, which is how cases normally are assigned in the federal court system. And this judge, who's working with closely with Kaplan and the Chevron prosecutor from the Chevron law firm, um, decided to lock me up in home detention. I'll say this, no lawyer in US history that we could find has ever been charged with criminal contempt of court. By the way, I believe I'm totally innocent, but even if I was guilty, even all the lawyers who've been guilty of this offense, this misdemeanor offense, not one has been locked up for even a day in jail, number one. And number two, not one has been locked up for even a day at home pre-trial. And I spent over 700 days prior to my trial, where by the way, I was denied a jury. And the same judge, Judge Preska, who locked me up as a supposed flight risk on a misdemeanor, um, is the one who found me guilty without a jury and she'll be the one sentencing me October 1st. I fully expect her to try to put me in jail, by the way, that day. So, you know, I'm up against a lot, but I think the larger issue is what does this mean for our country, our society, the law, the rule of law in America? It's scary. Yeah. I want to get into all of those questions. I'm probably, I'm probably answering your questions in advance by talking so much. I'll try to keep my answer no, shorter. No, it's great. It's yeah. great. It's good to have all of this grounding. So when we get yeah. into the some of the finer points of it, um, it's easier for, you know, the listeners to understand. But you just told the story, you just told a story that sounds like something out of Black Mirror, honestly. How is Chevron presenting this story in a way that makes them look good by any stretch of the imagination? Well, their, their narrative is simple. I mean, think about it. They, they committed a massive environmental crime in Ecuador. It wasn't an accident. It was deliberate to save money. Okay. Yeah. They needed to somehow get out of it. So, you know, they focus grouped it and they decided mm -hmm. they needed a face to put a face on something to get people to think about other than what they did. And that I became that face. And they basically are using me as a foil to distract attention from the fact that they were found guilty of massive environmental crimes and know the people of Ecuador, the indigenous people of Ecuador and other communities there in the affected area, billions of dollars. You know, so, you know, it's complicated because like, even when I do an interview like this, I'm sort of playing into their narrative, right? Like it's about Steven Donziger. It's not about Steven Donziger. It is about Chevron and the poisoning of the Amazon rainforest. Okay. You know, and, and I was one of the lawyers who helped hold the company accountable. By the way, we won the case, even though I'm locked up. Right. We're, we're the winners. They lost. Yep. Okay, that's why they're attacking me. But, you know, um, you know, it's a classic misdirection strategy. You see this often in politics. Yeah. I mean, we saw this constantly in, during the Trump years, right? I mean, basically constantly blaming other people for anything that didn't go his way. Um, and it's the blame game. It's scorched earth. It's, it's, it's a lot of what's gone wrong, in my opinion, in American politics over the last two, three decades. And it's sort of like, it's sort of like there's this playbook out there by the, by the right wing, the extreme right wing, to absolutely destroy those people <clears throat> who they believe threaten their privileges, you know, and, you know, apparently I've become one of those people, which is shocking to me since I've really have always just wanted to be a human rights lawyer helping people. But, yeah. you know, I guess, you know, I shouldn't be naive. I mean, basically what we have done poses a great financial risk to the fossil fuel industry and to Chevron, and they want to destroy me. I think more as a symbol, I, I don't take it that personally. I think it's a strategic decision to go after me as a way to stop people from doing this work more generally, because that really could hurt the industry in a big way. Absolutely. As you said, I want to focus on the indigenous communities and the environmental disaster as well. And you mentioned that when you first visited Ecuador, it looked apocalyptic. Can you describe that a little bit more? What was the environmental degradation and devastation there? 
Yeah, it was amazing. And I would urge people to, there's a lot of video of this on the internet and, and Vice Media did a really good 10 minute segment called um, the, the world's worst oil disaster you've never heard of where they have a lot of this footage. But, you know, when I went down there, I was a young lawyer in April of 1993 and we were taken around to the various impacted communities. And of course I expected to see pollution. I was utterly shocked at the extent of it. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I don't know how many people have traveled to the Amazon, but if you go to the pristine Amazon, it's really maybe one of the most extraordinary places on earth. I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful. It's everything's clean. It's fresh. There's no pollution. There's no chemicals. There's clean water, you know, there's clean air, there's food. Um, in these areas of the Amazon, it was like, again, it was apocalyptic. I mean, basically I came across literally lakes of oil. I mean, when I say lakes, I mean, imagine like two or three Olympic sized swimming pools of oil in the forest that had been there for who knows how long that no one was even attempting to clean up. And then I'd run across like other lakes where there was an attempt to clean up, but the cleanup consisted of the indigenous peoples who had been hired by the oil companies. In other words, it's on their land. Their land was the the, the land that had the oil lake on it. And they were paid who knows what, a few dollars a day to go in with literally no protection to wade into these lakes and attempt to clean them. But the, a lot of them were being cleaned with brooms, like brooms you would buy in a drugstore in Manhattan. I mean, there's no equipment. And I think it was just a farcical attempt to, you know, act, say they were employing local people to help clean. And obviously it wasn't a serious cleanup. But we've seen this time and time again, you know, in this area and, and, you know, there's never been a cleanup. And, you know, the other thing I saw is Texaco had built these waste pits. So when you drill for oil, so people know, you know, you're drilling thousands of feet into the ground and all this rock and, and um, hot water and oil and heavy metals that are naturally producing come out of the ground, but they're harmful. And also man-made chemicals to dislodge the rock that are often cancer causing, you know, like chromium six. So all this stuff that is coming out by creating a well hole going down thousands of feet has to be put somewhere. By the way, these materials are called drilling muds. And historically they need to be disposed of safely in Ecuador, all Texaco did was just gouge these giant holes out of the jungle and they, they dumped it right in with no lining, okay? And then to, to make sure that the pits were maintained, they would attach pipes to the sides of these pits um, and then run the content, you know, because it rains a lot. So they'd run the, when they'd overflow, they'd run the, the pipes and run the contents into nearby rivers and streams that indigenous peoples had relied on for their drink, were relying and still rely on, by the way, for their drinking water, for bathing, for fishing. And then on top of that, there was a massive lie that the Texaco engineers were perpetrating down there. Like they would be asked by the locals, like, what are you doing? Like this, you're ruining our water, you're ruining our environment. And the indigenous leaders would be told, oh, don't worry about it. You know, the oil is like milk. It has vitamins. I mean, literally, I've heard that story so many times that it was very clear to me that's what the Texaco engineers were trained to say when they were asked about why they were polluting. It was disgusting. And a total lack of respect for human life, a total you know, disrespect for indigenous culture, for the environment. Um, you know, I don't know how much you've been following this new phenomenon of trying to make ecocide, you know, the fifth atrocity crime. Yeah. But when I look at what Texaco did and now Chevron in Ecuador, to me, it's the very definition of ecocide. They mean, they, they, a corporation made a deliberate decision to pollute an area, to save money in such a way that completely altered the conditions of life such that people are dying and they can no longer survive. That's ecocide. This is what Chevron did in Ecuador, and I saw it with my own eyes. I mean, the first trip I saw it, I was just stunned. Couldn't turn my back on it, decided to get involved in the case. But of course, over the years, as I've studied the science behind oil pollution and what it does to people who are exposed and the animals and the environment, 
you know, it's, it's, it's even far worse now as I understand it than I understood it that first time I saw it back in April of 1993. So to zoom out a little bit, what is wrong inherently with the U.S. justice system that would allow something like this to happen? Yeah, that's a big question. Look, any yeah. country you go to, any society that I, I find that, and I've been, I've traveled all over the place, worked in different countries, but the justice system generally reflects the power structure of the society in which it exists. Um, now, there, there's rule of law principles that are designed to protect against bias in justice systems that most liberal democracies try to adhere to, including the United States. But they can be overpowered by other forces, which I think is what we're seeing in this situation here. But not just my situation, other situations. The Texas abortion law, you know, that that the Supreme Court just allowed to stand. You know, the police arresting protesters at the Line Three pipeline in Minnesota right now. I mean, hundreds of people arrested, Indigenous people on their own territory, by public police paid by the pipeline company. So you're seeing, I think, these breakdowns. I mean, first you're seeing the takeover of public functions by corporations. You're seeing that all over the place, not just in the United States, around the world. Privatizing water systems, for example, and privatizing public police in Minnesota to arrest pipeline protesters. You know, prosecuting directly lawyers like myself, the Chevron law firm Seward and Kissel here in New York. These are very worrying. Um, trends that I think completely undermine and threaten the rule of law in, you know, democratic liberal democracies like the United States. And I think the crazy part is I think most citizens are not aware of it. And when you have major institutions designed to check this abuse of power, like the New York Times ignoring these stories, you know, you're, you're in serious trouble. And, you know, people might breathe a sigh of relief that Donald Trump was not reelected but the forces of Trumpism, of this extreme right-wing approach, um, the, the, the whole Koch brothers funded network that's really sprouted up in huge force over the last 15 years in this country, I think are a threat to our democracy. I think our democracy in the United States is absolutely under threat. I think if you look at the United States objectively, we rank way down now on the list of most democratic societies because of voter suppression, police racism, you know, take corporate takeover of these public functions like I'm talking about. And frankly, it's it's an embarrassment. I mean, it, it, it you know, this is our country that we're talking about. And the things that I grew up with as a young lawyer are taken for granted in many respects are under threat or no longer exist. So, you know, we need to wake up. Um, you know, it's not just a matter of Trump or Biden, like there are forces at play in this country that are threatening to destroy our democracy. And you're seeing it play out in my the fact I'm in two years in house arrest on a misdemeanor to me would not happen, would not have happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago. This is part of these, you know, a product of these forces that have really reshaped many of our institutions to be dominated by corporations or corporate interests. I couldn't agree more. So what's the call to action here? For all the people who are listening, what is their step in their life that they should be taking? Well, I think you got to spread the word. I mean, I, to, to me, step one, it's easy to do and everybody can do it is get out there, get on social media, do whatever you can do to spread the word. I mean, you're spreading the word through your art and through your podcast, you know? Yeah. I'm spreading the word through my activism and by appearing on your podcast <laughs> um, and by speaking out and writing about these kinds of things. So, you know, it's very important we spread the word and that we also elect people in this country who get it. It's not working, okay? Yeah. And, and the two party system as we know it, I think also needs to change. I think we need a, a real people's party in this country mm -hmm. um, that can compete with the Democrats and the Republicans because I mean, first of all, the Republicans are no longer exist. That's the Trump party. Yeah. The Democrats have gone so far to the right that you, know, you can't even get a basic voter rights, voting rights law passed now. Yeah. Um, it's not Joe Biden's fault. I mean, it's just institutionally, it's just been so captured, yeah. you know, that we need to shake it up. 
or, or you know, this planet will be destroyed. The fossil fuel industry will continue to get its way. Um, inequality of wealth will continue to erode our basic institutions. I mean, I, you know, I have a broad critique, but I think the United States is on its way to becoming a failed state unless some of these problems are dealt with in a fundamental way. So because I want to end this episode on a slightly more positive <laughs> note, not, not, not that they are important things for us to think about, let's say you don't go to jail on October 1st. What do you do on October 2nd? Go to Zay bars. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. For those That's of you great. who don't know New York, Zay bars is one of those inst deli institutions that have great bagels, lox, cream cheese, and other stuff. No, I mean, look, I will do on October 2nd what I do every day, which is I'll wake up and bless the gods that I'm alive, love my family, and go to bat for people who need legal help who otherwise can't get it. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you've done, for the work that you're doing right now, and the work that I know you will continue to do. It's an inspiration for me personally, and I know that everyone who listened today learned an incredible amount. So just all I can say is Oh, well, you're, you. you're, you're so sweet. And thank you for what you and your colleagues do, both in creating art and influencing our culture in a positive way, and also you know, studying these issues academically in a way that I think I look forward to seeing what you do with what you get out of this, your academic experience. I think it's going to be awesome. Amazing. Just whatever you do, if you become a lawyer, try not, try not to get disbarred. <laughs>